Hi, we are back on today with Denny and Men. Before we get any further, I think we have rock star Paul Meeks on the line. Paul, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Awesome. Folks, Paul Meeks, you can see him most, uh, most every week on CNBC. He's a chartered financial analyst. When he speaks, people stop what they're doing. So my first kudos to you, sir, because just a couple months ago, I said, Paul, can this market keep going? And your answer was, yeah, I like evaluation. Even though we may be overvalued in certain things, I think equities can still uh, be single to possibly double-digit uh, returns. And Paul, you are right, sir. Golf clap, everybody. Paul Meeks. So, <laughs> so Paul, here's the next question. Dude, can this thing keep going? <laughs> yeah, I think so, because um, one of the issues is, although interest rates have started to rise, yes, they still are historically low. Remember, uh, rates back in the late 70s, early 80s were 20%-ish, <laughs> and now those uh, same rates are you know, 1% to 2%. And the reason I tell you that is that all assets, including stocks, uh, do very well in a low rate environment because uh, part of it is you can more easily get a higher valuation when you discount those cash flows. That's the mathematical reason. And the other reason is that uh, with low interest rates, bonds are essentially uninvestable, even for conservative investors, in my view. And uh, I still believe that U.S. equities are better than equities in foreign lands. And so the other part of it is, one part's math, the other part is that um, there aren't alternatives. Yeah, let's talk and about that. I mean, wh how, what, you, what do you think rates would have to be at where managers start saying, hey, uh, it's kind of looking attractive. Maybe I should park some safe money in that. We're still far from that, aren't we? From uh, Well, right now the uh, yield yeah. on a 10-year uh, maturity U.S. Treasury note, which uh, most people say is the risk-free rate in America. That's the benchmark. Yes. Uh, it's about 1.6%. Now it has come up from 0.5% in August. Yeah. But I think it would have to push uh, way past to closer to 3%. And it's actually after it's uh, moved since the summer, it started to stall. And so I think we're going to be okay. And in the meantime... Uh, the forecast, even a conservative forecast for economic growth this year for the U.S., uh, gross domestic product or GDP, yes, it's going to be 6 or 7%. I remember reading coming, that, yes. Yeah, coming out of the, um, the uh, COVID doldrums, and it will be the fastest uh, economic growth since 1983, 1984 in this country. And corporate earnings, which are you know, levered to economic growth, will probably grow this year 20% plus? Wow, think about that. I think they did state that March retail sales were up about 12% yeah. from the year before. So we're looking at all these factors. The economy seems to be going well. I guess the other two, two things that we talked about a couple of months ago, where's this COVID thing going and the unemployment rate? Those are still yeah. very important, aren't they? Yeah, I think that the only... Um a potential blemish on my forecast or risk is uh, if we fail to rapidly get everybody vaccinated and we end up having a kind of COVID-2 outbreak, right? which would take us back to businesses being closed like they were in March and April of uh, 2020. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but I think that's our biggest uh, risk. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the unemployment rate should continue to fall because with the vaccinations, we're comfortable to open up businesses and schools and people get back to work. Because a lot of people, uh, even though we live in a digital society now, they still have um, analog type jobs, which means for them to go to work at a restaurant or to be a bartender, you know, they gotta have uh, the place open. Speaking and of uh, that, that should happen, uh, I think in a big way, you know, once we get on the other side of the summer. Interesting. Now, speaking of digital, I have a guest today who's uh, so deep into cryptocurrencies. He's not a broker or anything, but uh, give us your 
What is your overall view on how cryptocurrencies seem to be the, the latest fad uh, coming out, Paul? I mean, yeah. I, I'm not recommending it to anyone, but it just fascinates me, some of these returns. Do you think that this is going to stick around, or is this something that's just kind of going to come and go? Uh, I think that we definitely will have a digital currency. Yes. Now, it may not be Bitcoin. It might be something else, but mm -hmm. it's inevitable that uh, we get rid of the coins and the dollar bills and uh, move to a digital currency. It looks like uh, China, you know, the world's number two economy, has sure. already made that announcement. And so it's inevitable, but in the meantime, a, a currency has to be a store of value and it has to be um, a high comfort level that uh, when you make a payment, the money is gonna be there. Exactly. And I don't think we're there yet. So right now, <laughs> uh, crypto is kind of a, um, speculative investment uh, it does yes. not have the characteristics yet of a true currency now when it has the characteristics of a true currency then it's uh, used widely for transactions but right now it's kind of a plaything. if they start building ETFs or platforms like that I guess that's when more people will get involved but yeah I right now you have to go to exchanges to partake I was just curious this is definitely not you're a very intelligent guy and so Look, as far as the market goes, it all goes back to supply and demand anyway. You have to put your money somewhere, and rates are low with bonds. Isn't that also the truth? Yeah, I think it's uh, very difficult to uh, make a case for bonds unless uh, rates start spiking. Uh, really rise. Because <laughs> I have a 92-year-old dad, and of course I helped him with his money, and he's the most conservative of all time. But I can, in good conscience, even put that guy into bonds that don't even yield uh, inflation and then the other problem is while interest rates are rising like they have since August sure uh, people don't realize this but uh, bond prices move opposite from interest rates right so right now interest rates are still low enough that they're unattractive however while they're moving it's a double whammy of bad because uh, the principal or the price of the bonds will fall as rates rise so right now uh, bonds actually have um, a higher potential than stocks for a loss of principal. So bonds are actually not a uh, conservative investment right now. They're actually the risky investment. I, I love to hear a smart guy uh, uh, accent what I tell my clients, because <laughs> I'm a lackey compared to you, but that's exactly right. As rates go higher, that paper, the value is going to go down. And, you know, right. they forget that bonds can be very, very speculative and risky as well. It's not... Uh, oh, yeah. Every every eighth yeah, of a everybody point. Everybody thinks that uh, <laughs> bonds are you know bulletproof uh, right. safe, but actually no, uh, you can lose principal on bonds. I'll give you an example. I think uh, the S and P five hundred, right, yes. which is uh, the benchmark of U.S. stocks, it's up about nine, ten, eleven percent so far in twenty twenty one. And the AGG, which is probably the best known ETF or index of bonds. Yes. Is actually down 3 or 4%. So, what you thought was uh, bulletproof safe is actually down this year and getting smoked by the SP 500. Well, bonds trade. It's not, I think the old thought process was people would buy and hold their bonds for 10, 20, or 30 years. Right. But they're trading now more. So, that's why I think that also leads to the volatility. Trying to guess what the Fed's going to do. You know, I also love the fact that you said, you know, I know we have a new administration, but that's going to have little to do with uh, things like gas prices. Like everyone thinks the president controls all these factors, and it's just not true, is it, Paul? Yeah, I actually uh, teach college finance. Uh, here where I live in Charleston, South Carolina, I teach at the Citadel, which is a military school. Uh, and I tell students all the time that it doesn't matter if it's Trump or Biden, when it comes to U.S. finance, the president, regardless of political party, is probably not even in the top 10 as far as the <laughs> most important people. The most important person is Jay Powell, who is the uh, chair of the Federal Reserve Board, our central bank. It's perception, Paul. It's just they think that it matters, but you, you talk to someone like you and you point out there's just not enough strong evidence to back that belief system. Is yeah, it? and I just have people uh, step back and actually dumb it down, and actually dumbing it down in this case is the smart thing to do. 
it's all about interest rates, not about politics, right. not about other stuff. It's all about interest rates, and interest rates and are still uh, historically ah, low. I'm glad we brought that up. What, inflation? Yes, inflation. Well, let, we haven't heard Chuck, that. Chuck just got excited, my <laughs> cryptocurrency guy, when I said inflation. <laughs> Paul, what, what, is your, what is your uh, prediction <laughs> on inflation in from, say, 2022 onward? Because, you know, being in this uh, COVID stimulus uh, environment globally, and you know, all the fiats are being uh, printed as fast as they can print it. What wh what is your take on the, the inflation as we move forward? That's an excellent question because then it dovetails into our conversation about bonds versus stocks. So here's what I think happens. I think as we reopen the economy, which we shouldn't be scared of, that should be a good thing. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, we will have a push in inflation, uh, probably to a higher, a little bit uncomfortable level. And the comfort level for the Federal Reserve Board, which actually controls monetary policy in this country, is about a 2% max. So I think we're going to actually push through that with a flood of uh, business reopenings. And uh, say it gets a little scary, you know, it gets past 2%, which in the past have been the uh, peak. But then what happens is after we go into a more normalized environment, right, something back to like a 2019 before COVID, and we get past this initial push of businesses, I think that inflation settles down again to about a 2% long-term average, and that would be okay. The only thing that I was thinking is, and again, I, I, I'm not getting political, but they're spending money faster than drunken sailors on shore leave on a weekend. I mean, they just did a $1.9 trillion. They're talking about doing another $2 trillion. So, Paul, honestly, yeah. that can't help things if they keep pushing that much money into the economy, can it? Yeah, that uh, worries me long term. It doesn't really worry me in the short to even intermediate term. Okay. In intermediate term, I mean several years from now. Right. Because what's happened with interest rates still low, and I expect them to stay fairly low, uh, the cost of um, paying our debt, despite the fact that we have more debt to pay with the uh, big projects coming out of Congress, yes. is actually quite manageable. Okay. Because hmm. it's not necessarily go. how much debt you have, it's the interest expense. And with interest rates low, you can actually handle a lot more payments. And as long as we stay in that paradigm where uh, interest expense is uh, low, we can handle a bigger debt load. But I'm, you know, no fool. I don't like the fact that yeah. we are now now four, five, six, seven trillion down the road. You know, there will be some hell to pay, but just not anytime soon. Gee, I think they'll say, "I've got an idea. We need money. What should we do?" <gasps> Here it is. Let's raise taxes. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's uh, that. coming because, uh, of course, uh, Biden talked about that even in his campaign. But yes, he did. I think it's, I think it's going to be hard to uh, push that through. Let, let's hope he week. doesn't get to it. Hey, Paul, how about a prediction on capital gains? Oh, oh well. as, far as, as far as the tax? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah I imagine that um, particularly since Biden's uh, plan is to focus on people that make over $400,000 a year, which is the wealth. And of course, the wealthy own a bulk of the stocks in this country and uh, you know most of the capital gains. So yeah, I, I think any kind of package, they'll have a, uh, a big push to raising capital gains taxes because you know he wants to take money from the wealthy and capital gains come in stock gains and the wealthy's got them. Yeah, I, I I like the way they categorize wealthy. They put it like if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year, you're wealthy. Like, what's the matter with you, uh, Paul? I so love having you on the show. And uh, remember, tell Joe Kern you got somebody watching your back, so he better be nice to you when you get on that show with him. Yeah, yeah, he uh, bust me up the last time I was on. <laughs> it's those days from when you uh, you were all in that same building in New York, right? Yeah, you know, now I, I do my stuff from remote camera, but uh, oh, okay. back in the days of old when I was running the tech fund for Merrill, you know, yeah. when I was in the studio, I would be right there with all the anchors, so I actually know them pretty well. Well, Paul Meeks, ladies and gentlemen, always a pleasure. Hey, let's check out things in a couple of months and see how we're rolling. And uh, are, are you going to be at the uh, the party uh, the end of this month? Are you coming in? Yes. Yeah. 
if you're there, I'm looking forward I'm going to be there, it. and let me let me just say that there will be some musical surprises at our gathering. Ooh, okay? yeah, I want to see you play. Okay, you're going to see it, buddy. Paul Meeks, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back on Today with Denny.